Hey everybody, welcome to Altium Academy. I am Zach Peterson. I am your local technical consultant with Altium. And today we are gonna look at a cool viewer question that we haven't been asked yet. We've been asked a lot of viewer questions about stuff like signal integrity and routing, but this one actually relates to design reviews. So on our power plane as a return path video, Praveen Sagotian writes, can you please kindly teach how to review the layout? That's exactly what we're gonna do today, Praveen. So let's go ahead and get started. What should you look for in a design review? There's a few different things that you should look for and you should really do multiple design reviews throughout the course of a project. So normally if you're doing everything, like you're starting with the engineering, you're doing the schematics, and then you're doing the PCB layout and eventually going to manufacturing, you should actually do reviews at each step in the process. So first, you would do requirements and then basic engineering and major component selection. You would wanna review that first and that'll be its own design review. Then once you get to the schematics, you'll wanna do a design review in the schematics. That's something that we'll look at briefly here. And when you're in the schematics, there's a few things that you should look at, but you should generally have a lot of this stuff in mind when you're actually making the schematics. Then once the PCB layout is finished, you wanna do a review of the PCB layout. You should really do that in multiple stages as well. I like to do the PCB layout once after component placement. So once placement is finalized, we'll do a design review just to make sure we're hitting all the mechanical constraints and just to make sure that all of the major stuff is in the right area. And during that initial process, we'll sometimes also do a footprint review. Although if you're getting your footprints like through the Altium Vault or you're getting them through maybe a creation service like Ultra Librarian or you're getting them off of Octopart, wherever you're getting your footprints, you should actually check them when you get the footprints. You don't wanna get into a situation where you do the PCB layout and you've got placement finalized and then, oh no, we have to change a bunch of footprints. Usually after you route the major buses, you wanna then do a design review, then you'll finalize everything, do one final review, then create the design outputs. The design outputs should also get their own review before sending off to manufacturing. And then once everything gets over to the manufacturer, they're gonna do their own review to make sure that everything that you've created in your CAD tool is compatible with their process. So that's all the different reviews. I know it sounds like a lot, but depending on the size of your project and the complexity, this is actually gonna be a big way to reduce your risk. And that's really important because the last thing you wanna do is spend 200 hours designing something, send it off to get prototyped, it gets built, all of a sudden it comes back and it doesn't work because you didn't check simple stuff like a footprint for a major processor or just basic DFM stuff. So that's the kind of stuff that we wanna look at. So I've got this project open right now in Altium Designer, and um, this is actually hosted on my on my Altium 365. So that's an actually a really easy way to share all of this design data with someone else who might be working with me. That way they can do part of the review, I can do part of the review, we can you know basically work together, put comments in the project, and that's really the easiest way to keep everything stored in one location as we go through this review process. I'm gonna open up the schematic. You know, this is just a really simple project um, that I kind of created uh, as part of an education initiative with Altium. We also actually showed this uh, particular project, as you'll see in a moment when we look at the PCB layout, we actually showed this in the assembly drawing video that just went up recently. So you'll have a chance to actually see what that layout looks like. So here, when we're inside of the schematics, you know, this should all be reviewed as each schematic page is created. And sometimes it can be a lot to keep track of. Typically what you wanna look for is look for stuff to make sure that like you didn't DNI a component when you didn't intend to. You wanna make sure that the net names are all consistent. I've actually had a situation where there was a typo in a net name and it was something simple. It was like sys reset and then sys reset in. And it was two different nets and we simply forgot to put in on one of the sys reset nets. So this is actually something really important because by doing that, we actually couldn't flash that particular board. And so we had to actually do some cutting and then you know soldering of wires in order to ground out a certain net so that we actually could flash that board. So it's even something really simple like just an incorrect net name in like a schematic that could cause a product to be non-functional. I wanna make sure that you know simple stuff like there's no typos in the, in the uh, part number. Um, my ground nets are all named consistently, assuming that they're all supposed to be on the same ground net. So this one is really 
really, you know, a really small schematic, but this just kind of gives you an idea of what to look for. Also, you'll note here, if I just zoom into U1, here I've got an NC directive. I wanna make sure that I didn't omit any of those. Now, you know, your ERC should pick that up. However, you do wanna check that. Here, we've got a port that leads off sheet. Um, originally, we had planned to kind of use a different sheet for this that was gonna include the input for that port. We're not gonna worry about that in this particular example. The other thing that you wanna look at uh, in schematics that could just be a little bit of a headache later, especially if you're doing a design for a client, is go down here to the title block, make sure you've got all of the information that they want in their title block. It's their design, it's their schematics. They want the PDF of this that they're probably gonna show to somebody. You wanna make sure that you put the right information in the title block. It's as easy as sending off an email to the client and just asking them, hey, do you have a pre-formatted title block? or is there any specific information that you wanna see? So simple stuff like that, um, that can actually save you a little bit of headache later. You know, obviously one of the things that you're doing here when you're building a schematic is you're gonna be doing a little bit of, uh, of an engineering review as well as just making sure that you've put all the right info into the schematic itself. So the engineering review kind of happens as you're going along and making the schematics, but then once you've actually got the CAD documents created, that's an important design, part of the design review uh, before you actually capture all of this and import all the components into the PCB layout and get started. Next, I'm just gonna go into the PCB layout and kind of give you an example of what you would want to look at in the PCB layout. The person who is uh, familiar with, with DFM principles should notice something almost immediately. And that particular thing that you should notice is if you look along the board edge, you'll see that there is no copper pullback from the board edge. Now, why exactly is that important? Well, this is really simple. It's something that you can enforce in a design rule. You can set a clearance from the copper to the board edge. But the reason it's important is that you gotta remember, they're gonna cut this out of a panel. And once it gets cut out of a panel with, uh, with a bit, uh, that bit is gonna leave some copper exposed along the side. So normally, they'll wanna see like eight or 10 mil clearance between the copper, so here this, this blue layer, which is the ground layer, um, and the edge of the board. So that's something you can actually set in the design rules. Now, if it's not set in the design rules, guess what? It's not gonna tr trigger a design rule error. So that's one simple thing to check. Another simple thing to check uh, as you're going through and looking at the layout is, uh, number one, are there any nets that are unrouted? So that's really simple. You can check that with a design rule check. Just go up here to the design menu, or the, sorry, the, the tools menu, design rule check, you can go ahead and run this in an entire batch. Some other points to look at that are usually pretty important right after placement are placement of critical connections. So here I've got V in listed right here. That's gonna be the input voltage for this little regulator board. I've got V out noted right here. Are the plus and the minus indicators actually correct? Do they show the correct you know, placement of the plus and minus uh, connections? Obviously that's important. We can see that here. Yes, indeed they are. Simple stuff like, you know, do I have a pin one indicator on everything? For some stuff, you don't really need a pin one indicator. You know, stuff like, you know, these resistors, like who cares? They can be either, either orientation. Some other stuff uh, that is important is if I actually go over here to solder mask. So here in this uh, layer, you can actually see solder mask openings uh, where pads are gonna be, or where components, I should say, are gonna be soldered onto copper uh, in the PCB layout. So this actually shows you what the opening is gonna be uh, around those pads. And if you go into the 3D view, you can actually see what that opening looks like. So you can see I've got this opening right here in between this exposed copper and then the rest of the solder mask. One point that sometimes doesn't get mentioned and it normally only comes up in really uh, really high density design is what should that solder mask uh, uh, size be and what I mean is like what should this you know minimum size of this uh, little sliver be this is called a solder mask sliver okay so that is something that you can actually also set in a design rule. And this was something that actually happened to me recently when I had done a pretty high density board and the, the solder mask sliver rule was actually never set by the designer I was working with. And so I had to actually go back and set it and then make sure that we actually allotted enough spacing between components in order to uh, properly assemble the board. The reason that's important is because those little slivers of solder mask, 
they can actually pop off if they get too thin, thin. And so it leaves a bridge or a potential bridge, I should say, between pads on a component. Here in your manufacturing rules, uh, you can actually see there are several of these different uh, of these different DFM rules. So there's stuff like you know silk to solder, silk to silk. These are all important. Net antenna. These are things that you can check manually, but you can also set these as design rules, and that is actually going to be really important because once you run the design rule check tool in Altium Designer or in your other CAD tool, it's going to flag all of that stuff. A big part of that design or the the design review is clearing out any of those errors that come up. So I had mentioned solder mask sliver. Um, you can actually see it right here under the manufacturing rules, uh, minimum solder mask sliver. Um, you know, you could get that down to five mils, just depends on the manufacturer if it's going to be high density. 10 mils is kind of default. That's just fine. But you'll notice here on these footprints, like I can already tell visually that this is actually going to be too small. So here, if I go to the 2D view and then I click on pads and I go down here to the solder mask. Um, you can actually see where the solder mask expansion rule is set here to four mils. So, I mean, is that big, is that small? Well, it's only big when it creates a potential assembly defect like this, okay? So this sliver right here for solder mask is actually pretty small. So I can actually go ahead and measure this. And your measurement tool is gonna to be really important for running a design review because you're gonna to wanna to be able to measure some of this stuff. So you can see it's 1.8 mils. That might be something a fabricator flags and during their own DFM review, they may not check for it. So that's just one of those things that you can visually spot yourself. This is just one example, but these types of things are important because they should be programmed into the design rules ahead of time. So this should underscore the importance of programming in those rules for your fabrication and assembly. And that's actually something we're gonna go over in another video series that we're doing on a four layer board we're actually gonna show an example of that. So just keep watching the channel and you'll see that yourself. Some other things that tend to happen that we actually brought up in an earlier video on silk screen is sometimes these silk screen indicators or these reference designators can start to like pile up on each other, especially when a board gets really dense. You wanna make sure that you leave some spacing and move those around. Again, if you look at the design rules, you know, silk to silk clearance rule should trigger um, if those uh, silk screen indicators or any silk screen markings get too close to each other. Typically what you would wanna do also if you have an enclosure that this is gonna go in is you would wanna actually like export a step file, take that step file into a mechanical program with your enclosure and then ensure that the step file is actually gonna fit, or not the step file, but the step model for that uh, board is actually gonna fit in the enclosure. So if you wanna do that, uh, you can actually go here to file and export, and then you'll see right here, step 3D. That's gonna export your entire board as a step model. You can then go and check it in a mechanical program. So we looked at some, you know, kind of basic manufacturing and assembly stuff. Some other things you would want to look at are critical interconnects. Again, if you programmed your design rules correctly, have some assurance that once you run that DRC, uh, it's actually going to trigger any design rule violations that might be really to, related to like impedance or clearances. But sometimes things like uh, noise or crosstalk, uh, things like uh, parasitic coupling around the board aren't necessarily going to trigger because they rely a bit on your intuition. And so you should take note of where like your high speed, high frequency lines are being routed and make sure that you don't put them too close to other components or lines that could interfere with them. So essentially, if you did your placement and routing checks first, then you'll have a plan for where you're gonna route those sensitive lines and then once you go and route everything, you can do another design review just to make sure that you didn't actually get stuff too close together and create some potential interference between signals. So that's another important point. We don't really have any of that in this particular board. However, that is something you would actually wanna look for in maybe a more advanced board that has a bunch of digital or mixed signal on it. Next thing that you'd wanna do is uh, you would want to actually look at your outputs. So I'm gonna create a new out job file real quick and uh, the out job file here, the main thing that we would wanna look at is like what gets exported in the Gerbers. So I'm adding a new entry for uh, Gerbers. Uh, this is going to be fabrication 
output and then I'm going to configure it. And I want to make sure that we're exporting all of the layers that we need. So sometimes what happens when you create this type of file, maybe use it for one project and then bring it over to a new project is sometimes settings don't get applied where they're needed. I've had uh, fabricators email me back saying, hey, you know, this, this one layer that we need wasn't included in your Gerbers. Can you please send that to us? So um, something as simple as just checking your output file settings. You can just go ahead and go through here and select all of the uh, important uh, layers that you're gonna need to export. So generally, it's gonna be your copper layers, obviously, um, your solder mask uh, layers, and then your overlay layers. And then, um, you know, mechanical layers, just depends what's in them, uh, but you wanna make sure you're exporting all the correct layers. The other thing, though, that you wanna check for here is if you look on the right, you see mechanical layers to add to all plots. Now, this is actually really important because Sometimes there will be information included in a mechanical layer and you might want to add that to every single uh, Gerber file that gets exported. So simple example would be like the board outline. Maybe I want to include the board outline on all of my Gerber layers. That's something that's reasonable. But what you wouldn't want to do is have a bunch of strange stuff that you maybe created in the CAD program. Uh, maybe it's like printed circuits that you wanted to use on an RF board. You put that into a mechanical layer and then you would check one of these boxes accidentally, so like mechanical one here, then that's gonna get superimposed on all of your Gerber files. Then when you export it, you then send off those Gerbers somewhere. They may not actually check them and just put it into fabrication. And then you're gonna come back with this weird looking board. If you see what looks like really strange stuff in your Gerbers after you export them and review them, you wanna check that you didn't actually mirror a mechanical layer or some other layer over onto all of your Gerber files. But you do wanna review your Gerber files just to make sure that when they, you know, what you're seeing in your Gerber files actually matches the layers in your PCB layout. And you just wanna make sure that everything looks consistent. Now, once those get sent off to your fabricator, they're gonna do their own DFM check. They're gonna tell you if anything needs to be changed. You're gonna do that in the PCB layout, regenerate those Gerber files, do a quick review again of whatever the changes were. You go in this little circle until everything is you know, released to production and then you're good to go. Okay, so I know this is a lot of information and to be honest, like everything that you would need to check in the design review is much too long to put into a single video. So what I've done is there's some links in the description. Go check out those links to those blogs. Those blogs are gonna show you some of the stuff that you need to look for in a design review as well as what your fabricator is gonna look for in a design review. So go check that out and learn as much as you can because if you learn this and you practice it, it's gonna become second nature. Thanks for checking out this video. If you like this video, hit that like button. If you wanna see more videos, hit the subscribe button. Leave your questions and comments in the comments section. And definitely, don't forget to call your fabricator.